Uh, my name is Matthijs van Hotegem, uh, Libre Treasurer, but I'm here to chair our next strategy update, uh, which will be presented by Christine Stone from Ex Libris. And it's a particular pleasure for me to uh, introduce her and um, introduce this strategy update, as uh, Ex Libris is a very uh, loyal participant in our conferences. And every year, uh, they give recent user studies of how our users use our systems, use Ex Libris systems, uh, discover our information, because we're talking about open science, and open science is, is very nice, and being open is very nice, but our users have to find this information and be able to process it. Yes. Um, and Eclipse is very experienced in that, and I'm happy to say that in the next presentation we'll uh, see some examples of it, um, and Christine will lift the top of the wheel. Um, uh, Christine is Senior Product Manager at Eclipse, uh, focusing on um, uh, Prima Discovery and the Central Index. Uh, but she's a true librarian as well, so she's actually one of us, uh, having studied library studies at the Freie Universität zu Berlin. Christine, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, hello, everyone. I'm glad to see so many people. Actually, last time I was at LIBA is, is many, many years ago, and there were um, a lot fewer, quite a bit fewer um, participants, so it's great to see that this conference is uh, growing so big. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, discovery, learning, teaching in the context of um, the library being an integral part of higher education. Um, so I'm just going to skip to my topics. Um, first of all, I'm going to talk about user studies. That is a project that I run last year. Um, and I would like to just present some of the results. Obviously, we have limited time, so I'm only going to um, talk about it briefly. But I would like to use it also to highlight some of the concepts of discovery um, that are very important for discovery systems, but I think also things that uh, can give you some ideas what to do um, and how to serve your users in that context. Um, so the second part is discovery concepts and ideas, and I'm going to show you some examples. And then I would like to branch out a little bit beyond um, the typical um, maybe library processes or discovery processes and look at other um, systems or other um, processes that are important in institutions of higher education. And in the last part, I just um, lead over to Leganto, which is our new reading list product, which is currently in development. And I think it's a very good example about um, cross-system workflows where you just have workflows that are typical for the library, but actually it's branching out to teaching and learning and is combining both in, um, in a, a single workflow. So let me start with um, the user studies. Just generally speaking, users come with different expectations to the library. Um, they want to have access to a known book or article. And in fact, if you look at the search logs, or if we look at our central search logs in Primo, um, over 50% of the searches are classified as known item searches. So that's a very big part of it. Um, but users may also want to find material for a course assignment. They may just want to um, get a quick overview of a specific topic, locate the latest articles in a specific field, or just obtain other data um, for other projects. And you can probably think of other reasons why someone is coming to the library or coming um, specifically to the um, discovery system. So there are a variety of reasons here. Um, the reason why we wanted to do user studies last year is that we felt that we really moved towards um, a second generation discovery system now. Um, we've been in this field for quite a while. A lot of libraries already have discovery systems. We've got our experiences over the years. Um, you have your experiences with your users. And it's quite good time to um, review our knowledge and also review the assumptions that we are making when we're looking at systems. Um, so the purpose was really to challenge our own assumptions. It doesn't mean that we're necessarily making the wrong assumptions, but we really wanted to confirm that we are going the right way. Um, and we wanted to gain some new insights here. So some of the questions were, who are the potential users or the users that we have and what do they need um, in terms of um, understanding differences and similarities, um, identify recurring themes, and I come back to this later on because I'm going to, to list some of those um, on my slides, and then cluster them into groups and see what they are required. Are. Um, and in the end of the day, for us, we are developing systems. So for us, it is about enhancing discovery experience and developing um, the features for our discovery products. Um, just briefly about the methodology, um, we did work with some libraries. So we had some library reported user scenarios, um, and we ran some workshops. I ran a workshop at um, Harvard last year, and we invited a number of different libraries of different sizes to participate. The, the, point or the, the um, 
um, the reason for the workshop was really to get um, an idea of what the libraries think about their users, what they think their users want, and what type of user scenarios are being reported or coming to the libraries. And then we did a very short version of that same workshop in, in Oxford last year. But the most important part for me was um, really user interviews and questionnaires that we did directly with, with users. Um, we ended up um, with, I think, 42, something like 42 scenarios. Um, 24 of those came directly from users from the questionnaires and, and the interviews. Um, the recurring themes, um, some of them are really not new. For some of them, you would probably say, yes, we knew that. And that's also good because, again, this is confirming the assumptions that we are making. And some of them um, were a little bit surprising. Um, so students often need to build up terminology first, um, and that's graduates to understand their research area first and then narrow it down, for example, if someone is starting a master's thesis, um, undergraduates to gain more knowledge for papers and projects, and that's particularly the case if the student has to write an end-of-year paper and they need to go beyond the reading list um, and just start um, searching for material themselves. Um, undergraduate students take most of the resources from the reading list or from set textbooks, but there are exceptions. Um, the mentioned end of year paper, but also in certain programs, excellence programs, for example, students are um, expected to go beyond the course material in the first place. Um, so they're going beyond the, the reading lists here. Um, faculty members and researchers know their core publications. That's um, not really surprising. They're usually but not always interested in the newest material. Um, it depends also on the discipline. Um, they often follow citation trails to find similar material. That is, they're going to a journal, to a journal article, and they find references, and then they go from one to the other and to, to the next one to find more material. So the actual search is actually very short. They're, maybe they run one search for this one article, but then they're just going from one thing to the other. And they may also follow author trails, that is, if they know the authors and the co-authors, which is often the case if you go beyond postgraduate. Um, graduates and researchers also tend to look for thorough lists of literature, um, and they often work on projects where they need an overview as well as very specific aspects of the topic. Um, that particularly um, applies to, to graduates. Um, I had this answer from a variety of people, specifically um, people who are in, in their master um, student studies or start a PhD program and that sort of thing. Um, Different subjects, undergraduates in the humanities work often on papers and essays, and that is what they need literature for. Um, again, they're taking a lot of literature from the reading lists, but not everything, and for some of them, it's an expected part of their studies that they um, go beyond the reading list. Undergraduates in the sciences tend to work towards exams. Um, they're often satisfied with textbooks. Um, they use other literature for occasional tasks. That is, for example, they have to present about a specific topic in their, um, in their coursework, and for that they need, um, they need further material, and I'll show you an example later on. Um, also noteworthy, and that's maybe particularly important for us, the same subject is not taught in the same way in every country. Um, so, for example, in medicine, um, we had in the U.S. a lot of feedback about um, people asking a lot of practical questions when they come to the library, like, you know, reverse drug effects and that sort of thing, um, because they start very early on in their studies to work in hospitals and do practical work. Um, and it was the opposite in Germany, um, where the students told me they're just learning for exams at the moment. This is, you know, in the first terms, they're not really getting to do any practical work, so their questions are very, very different, and their tasks are very different. It's especially in the first three years. Um, user stories, um, we asked a number of questions in our um, interviews and in, in our questionnaires. Um, a lot of them also about background. We wanted to know what's your academic level, what is the discipline you're studying, etc. what you like, what you don't like, and all these usual questions. But the last one was about give us a scenario where you um, recently had a task what you needed literature for. Um, and this for me was really the most um, interesting part, um, especially in the interviews. Um, I often got the answer first, oh, we don't use the library. And then the second thing was, oh, yes, I recently I actually, you know, I went to the library and I searched this and that. And the more you asked, the more it actually turned out that they actually did use the library. But the first answer was, oh, you know, I, I don't know much about the library. Um, so um, the user stories, um, they're quite different ones. Um, I just listed two of them here. First one is an undergraduate student in medicine um, who had a task where he had to um, uh, report or present about a specific disease 
Um, and he said most important for me was to gain a general overview of the topics and the current status of research. And he wasn't quite sure at the beginning. Um, he kind of Googled it, but didn't really get much. Um, so he needed some help from peers. And um, when he had this, then he could actually really search and get into things. And he really enjoyed it. Um, the second one is a research in history, who said in researching Scandinavian migration to the United States in the 19th century and its impact on local history and religious institution, it was necessary for him to um, look at a number of different publications from different times. Um, and he said nothing was really comprehensive, so he needed to look into um, different, um, different titles. Um, two more. The first one is very similar to the, to the medical student. Um, recently, I needed to find a research paper to um, prepare for a talk about semiconductor optical amplifiers. And again, he needed to have an overview and present recent developments in the field, um, but also the original publications. And then a graduate student in Meselson um, who said first that she works mostly towards exams. And when I asked her about the PhD that she's starting next year, she actually said to me that her professor gave her a couple of articles to read, um, which were written by him, of course. And um, she looked at it and she just thought it was much too difficult for her, much too specialized at this point, because she was just starting to get into this research area. So actually, she had to go back and get overview articles and then some more specialized research articles for the same area. Um, so it was really both for her again. She started from scratch from the overview view before she actually could get into detail. So some of the conclusions, there are also some other conclusions we can draw, but these were the ones which were interesting for us in our context. Um, many users include learning as a desired part of the information research, for example, to build up terminology. Actually, none of them said explicitly anything about learning, but it was just clear from the scenarios that they needed to learn about the topic, they needed to learn um, the words actually to do the searching, etc. So that was really very much part of their, um, their information quest. Um, researchers and grad students like to follow trails to find relevant material. Um, and of course, different disciplines and academic grades behave differently and have different expectations. So if you translate this into the discovery system, um, people come and run a search, but the same search does not necessarily mean the same thing for, the same, uh, for a different person. So the, the result lists actually need to reflect somehow the, the personal context of the user. Um, that's also a concept that we call personalization. And then the last one is integration with other institutional tools and services is of key importance. And I think this is an area where we really look, need to look very closely beyond what we're doing in the libraries, but also beyond um, what we're maybe look, um, doing in the institution. Um, the most obvious relation here is the reading list. Because, you know, many students say, oh, most of the literature we get from the reading list, but we need to go beyond the reading list. So you already see that there's a relation between discovery, um, uh, the discovery tool and the reading list. Um, so there are four discovery core concepts that we can really derive from that. Um, the first one, of course, being search and find. And I mentioned before that over 50% of our searches in our search logs are known item searches. So this is at the core of discovery, search and find. Um, but there are also other concepts to look at. And one is um, exploration, which is very much related to learning, because obviously when I explore or while I explore, I also learn. Um, interesting enough, there was um, earlier this year a call for papers um, for one of the information sciences journals, which is going to come out in December with a special issue about learning while searching. So we are not talking about information literacy here. We are talking about actually learning about the topic that I'm researching or that I'm learning about while I'm searching. So exploration is really part of this. And I already mentioned personalization. So I'd like to focus for a moment on exploration and learning and just show some examples how in discovery this can be supported. Um, so for example, um, when I studied, um, I still had lots of bookshelves. So I went into the library, you know, grab one book, and then you look at the, the shelf and the vicinity of the book and you find other things. And if you're like me, like books, then you just see lots of interesting things and you pick one of, after the others. Um, but this kind of is, is a little bit lost in the virtual world. So if, you're going to, if you go to discovery, you really need something to replace that. And one option to do this is virtual browse. So it's actually basically the same as looking at the bookshelf. You're sitting in front of the computer, you see one book that is of 
interest. And for the virtual browse, you can then browse through the book covers that are in the vicinity of this particular book. So you have kind of a serendipitous ex um, uh, discovery experience here where you find things by coincidence, but they are related because they are in your context. Um, seeing a preview, that is um, a tool um, that allows you to push certain resources. So for example, if you have a lot of nice images in your library, but it wouldn't occur to the student to actually look for these images because he doesn't know anything about it. So the student, again, comes to the library, runs a search in the discovery system, but you can add a, some sort of featured result list which is showing the images. And in this case, it's actually about eBooks. Um, so there can be different types of resources that can be featured in that result list and then you can have in your primo result list. Um, one of my favorite tools actually is the BX Recommender because I also use it myself. I'm doing an undergraduate in history and at the Open University and um, you know, I, I'd like to branch out um, especially for um, uh, topics that are of particular interest to me and find material beyond my reading list. Um, so again, I'm running a search in my discovery system, and in this case, I looked for Sugar Revolution, um, which was one of my topics, and I find an article, but through the BX Recommender, which connects articles by usage, um, I find other articles. So I have a very general search, Sugar Revolution, it's really very kind of ambiguous search, um, and I find a general overview article, but the recommender is giving me more specialized articles. So it's not just about the material, it's also about terminology. So I'm learning more terms just by looking at this one article and looking at the recommendations. And I can also treat this as a trail now. So if I'm looking at exploration, I can click on one of the articles of interest and find the next set of recommended articles. And I can go on and on and on. So again, talking about trails or talking about citation trails, for example, this is another sort of trail. So I can go from one to the other. Um, at the moment, the BX recommender is um, integrated in the, the Primo UI, but it's really about, I'm going to an article and I see a number of articles which are um, related to this one. Um, we're creating a new user interface at the moment for Primo, and um, we want to have a more integrated exploration to, um, flow there. So we, it's, it's visually more about exploration and learning. Okay, so these were just some ideas what um, a discovery system can do to support those discovery concepts. But I would like to branch out and look a little bit more at other processes that um, are part of the institution. So you have, um, in our case, in the middle of the, the, the discovery system and the resource management system, of course, which is very related to that. And then there are other library services, which I haven't really listed here. Um, and then you branch out and you look a little bit further on and you see that you have um, student mobile apps, you have the reading list, um, which lists all the course reading for one specific course. You have the course management system. You may have institutional port portals. Um, you have Google, of course. A lot of the users are using Google. I had a lot of answers from users who said they start the search in Google. And then you have content repositories and probably also other systems in your library which are um, of relevance here. So if we're looking at, uh, again, from a discovery um, perspective, um, this is an example from Boston University. I quite like what they did because they, they made Primo really theirs. It's, it's their system and they integrated their flows and, and their services into the system and made it um, really adjusted it to, to that. So one of the things they've done is they, um, um, they indexed their research guides. So if I search, for example, for nonlinear science, I get first the, the research guide in nonlinear science. And then I can jump over and I'm actually in the research guide. Um, and it lists some core databases that are of interest and it may also list other things um, that are for, of interest for that particular topic. Um, and they also put the search box here. So if you look at the top right, you have always the Primo search box everywhere, regardless where you're going. So you, it's, it's really bi-directional, bi-directional linking. You're um, taking a deep link into the research guides at the point of need, or you can also go back and start a search um, in the discovery system again. Um, equally, they're also um, indexing the course reserves. So I, as a student, I can just go and I can just type in the, the number or the code of my course and I get um, all the readings that are recommended for my course. So here we are already in teaching and learning and in reading lists and other processes. So it's very close um, related here to discovery. And they're also um, integrated alt metrics. Um, 
So some of the ideas here are everything is discoverable, everything should be in the same system, but it has different entry points. So for one, they have the library collection, electronic resources, and you can also have the research data sets, digital repositories, research guides, as we just saw in the e-reserves, in one system, and you have one um, user interface for it. But actually, you can also use that to build a sitemap and then it's discoverable via Google as well. And you have lots of users who obviously start from Google, but then they may go into the discovery system and um, continue their search there. And then you have, which is very pale on the bottom, um, the search box, which really fits um, into every, um, every interface. Um, so looking a little bit um, further afield again, um, again, you have the discovery and the resource management. What we looked at was really um, at things from a discovery perspective. So in the next part, I would like to look a little bit more um, into the, the system part. Um, specifically, I would like to introduce Leganto, which is a new reading list product that we are currently developing. And Leganto is based on cross-product workflows, and that's, for me personally, one of the most interesting aspects of Leganto. So first of all, a little bit of the, the background. Um, there are a number of challenges, and when we did some research last year, which actually led to the decision to develop that system, these were really the reasons that we looked at. Um, the current systems are very complex and often disintegrated processes, or have disintegrated processes to create them, and that's coming back really to the cross-system workflows again. Um, they require a lot of manual work. Um, and often the instructors are bypassing the library. And that, again, the library plays a really integral part here, a very important part, and I'll show you an example workflow in a minute. Um, so actually, um, having a reading list which has no integration with the library at all is kind of contraproductive um, to everyone involved. Um, so what does Leganto do? It has um, three stakeholders, or three main stakeholders. Um, instructors, obviously, to create and maintain and evaluate and share the resort list, and also monitor their use, because that's also part of the system. Um, students to access the materials, that's the first, first use of it, but they can also share their views there, so there's a social um, part of it and suggest additional materials. And then the librarians um, are a real important stakeholder here because they make materials available um, through the library management service, and I'll show you in a minute because it, there's obviously something also related to copyright clearance and that sort of thing. And then it supports cross-system workflows, and I think this is one of the most important aspects here. So looking at an example, um, I have obviously an authentication system for single sign-on. I have a course management system. Um, I have the resource list. We're now talking about the, the, the reading list, so I put this into the middle here. Then we have discovery on the library side. We have the library management, um, the library management system, and obviously also the copyright clearance service. So this is all kind of distributed somewhere. So if we look at it from a systems point of view, I have here um, now Primo and Alma, I have Blackboard as course management system, and I have Leganto in the middle. Um, an instructor wishes to add something to the reading list, so they choose something for next week's class. Um, so the instructor logs in, chooses the course and the week, and then opens the course resource list. Next, the instructor enters the book title and finds the book in Primo, so that's the discovery part, and he then adds it to the resort loss list, and he can also add a note for the library, um, so for example, check chapter six, please, because this is the chapter he wants for his course. Um, next, an automated notification is sent to Alma, Alma in this case is the library system here, and it triggers the relevant Alma workflow. So this is where, it, when, it, um, when it actually uh, moves to the library. The task is assigned to a librarian who is processing the request, and the book chapter is scanned. And obviously, we have copyrights to um, adhere to, so um, the copyright is, is cleared at the end of the process. And then when it's done, it's ready for use. So you can see there are different systems which are used here, and every system has its own task. But in the end of the day, if you look at the connection between what the library does and what the instructor does in teaching and learning, there's a very close relationship here, and there really need to be very closely um, integrated workflows. And that is exactly what Leganto does. 
Um, just to give another example, this is the, the user interface for Liganto. Um, this is um, the view of the instructor. Um, but the instructor finds items not just in Primo, they find items everywhere. So for example, in Amazon. Um, and we built, we built a little tool, a little web tool that the instructor can use to um, download metadata and scrape metadata from the web pages and um, transfer them into Liganto. So in, in Amazon, I find a book. I use this um, little web tool. You can see there's a little um, plug-in on top. Add this to my collection. Um, it grabs the metadata, and at the end of the process, it puts it into the collection. And then the um, instructor can just um, grab and drop the um, collection items into specific course reading lists. So it's a very easy way to do that. Um, it's also a very um, modern way, so to speak, um, to use cross systems. Um, this is in development. These are the development partners. Um, so we are um, currently um, working on the first version. Um, and um, yeah, that's uh, just uh, something exciting to come. Just to summarize, um, Library services, at least in my view, should, should really be a core part of higher education environments. And there are a lot of other systems here which we haven't touched on today at all. Um, you have teaching and learning, and I talked a lot about teaching and learning because there's a reading list in between, and there are also course reserves, and there's a lot of relationships between discovery and between the reading list and what the instructors are doing. Um, and we also have the course management systems, etc. But we also have the research part, so there are lots of systems there where we can look at cross-system workflows, and that's something that that we currently do. That's one of my research areas to look at the different institutional processes and look how they integrate with the processes that we're providing with our systems, um, such as discovery, resource management, etc. And of course, you also have um, Google there. Um, and speaking from a strategic point of view, there's of course a big move into mobile. Um, so you may know that, um, that Ex Libris just acquired OMBL, which is um, at a mobile platform. Um, so we're looking very much into that area, and that's also something where I see in future library services integrating with institutional services on a mobile platform rather than standing on its own. So it's a real integrated approach. And I think in my pers personal view, from a strategic point of view, that's the right move um, for us and also for the libraries. Okay. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for Christine? Um, Bob, I will ask a question. Um, you, you did a survey into to, uh, user habits. Um, mm -hmm. and I, I very much appreciate that you also made a connection to, to development in, in, in education. Um, can you see how different kinds of types of education affects the, the way people use uh, the search engine? For instance, um, classical um, uh, education, but also uh, problem-based learning. Do you see any difference in how people approach uh, these services? Um, we didn't go in such detail, I have to say. Um, I just looked more at the, the output and, and what people did um, for their specific course readings or for, for their, their research. We didn't go into that, that detail. Um, I also interviewed people from very, very different institutions. So we didn't really look at, it was not a quantitative study. It's different if you go and um, you go to your institution and they're all kind of in the same environment or you know same approaches, but you don't have that if you go, go across institution. So I, I wouldn't be able to draw such um, conclusions. Um, we did ask some questions. Um, such as um, um, how, like how people go upon you know, searching literature, etc. But I didn't find the output useful enough, to be honest, to draw any conclusions um, based on that. Um, there were a number of questions which were interesting, where the, the answers were interesting, but they were not really good enough to draw any conclusions from it. So to answer it, no, we didn't look at it at all. So I wouldn't be able to comment on that. Yeah. One of the other things maybe that was also interesting in terms of mobile use, um, I did ask the, the students or the, um, the participants if they use tablets, for example, or mobile phones, etc., smartphones. 
And um, the general answer was that tablets, actually only one person used tablets um, to read articles. It seemed to them that they used, or they, it seemed to me that they mostly used laptops for all their work and smartphones on the go and um, tablets from time to time for quick things. Um, that was particularly interesting for me because I just wanted to know what they used tablets for. And um, that wasn't a big use for tablets. But it's not quantitative, so I can't say, you know, so and so many percent um, use this or that. But it was just, for me, it was just interesting to, to hear. Okay, thank you. Any, any other questions? Yeah? There in the back? Thank you. Heli Kautunen from the National Library of Finland. I, first of all, I have to comment uh, that this approach you've taken, the user-centeredness, I thank you for that. That's the way to go. Uh, um, my question concerns uh, cross-disciplinarity. Did you come across with any indications that uh, students or researchers are uh, crossing disciplines when they search for information? Um, yes and no. There were some who talked about it, but it was not, it was not a very, uh, very strong, um, there was not a very strong sense of that, um, not at all. Um, the undergraduates are very, they're really after their points, let's put it that way. <laughs> they want to pass the exams and get good points for their, um, for their assignments. And um, good points, is, it, it means something different in different institutions because if you're in an excellence program, there's just a certain expectation that you, you have to fulfill certain needs or certain, you know, certain measures and then you get your points. While in other institutions, it's completely different. Um, so I, you know, I would assume that in some institutions, the demand for doing multidisciplinary research or working across discipline is much higher than in other institutions. I didn't hear any of this from any of the participants. Any further questions? Well, perhaps I could ask for more, but it still strikes me there are so many known items search. Mm -hmm. um, and you have this, this elaborate discovery tool with many layers. Um, could we find a way to get people straight to, where the, to the item they want? For instance, the I feel lucky button you have in, 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 in Google, for instance, you can just straight to this, this item? Or well, I mean, known item search is, is obviously supported. You search for an item, you should find it on top of the result list. I mean, that's, that's no question. Uh, with the, the lucky guess is, is probably a different story. I mean, we, we can also, one of the areas I'm looking at is personalization. I didn't really touch on it here, but it's a whole area because it's not just about personalization, it's about anticipatory discovery, which is Google doing. Google is guessing from your past context what you might want. Uh, it's not so much a lucky guess, it's more like they're kind of restricting um, the information you're searching in or ranking it differently depending on your past. And I know there are lots of discussions about this also in the discovery context. Um, obviously, in our area, there are lots of privacy issues there um, because you, you, know, you, you don't want to save um, specific user information in your discovery system. That's not something that we do. We, we cannot relate certain searches back to certain users at the moment. I mean, obviously, it's something you can develop, but again, it's a privacy issue. Um, so using that information to actually influence your um, results is, is very tricky. Um, the, the other thing I would say about that is that, um, first of all, Google has critical mass. It doesn't necessarily mean that we have critical mass in the discovery systems. How often does an individual user come to the discovery system? Um, they come maybe once a week in a certain phase of their research. They may come every day and maybe several times a day, but that's more the exception. Um, that's different in Google. I mean, I don't know if you know how many times per day you go to Google. I go quite often for different things, but they have a, a much higher mass of searches from an individual person than we have in a discovery system. So, you know, that's, that's the second thing. And the, 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 the third um, aspect, I think, here is that um, you're much more creating a certain bubble um, in research and in academia than you do in Google when you restrict searches to a certain, um, you know, to, to a certain search history. Um, what we are doing in discovery is personalization. Personalization is about active so choices rather than, um, rather than um, inactive choices, so to speak. Um, so we're allowing people to, to 
spe to specify their discipline, and then this changes the ranking, um, which is good for ambiguous searches. So this is some, something that we are doing, but uh, otherwise it's a tricky area. Um. Okay. Can I allow for one final question, perhaps? If not, okay. Thank you very much, Christine. Thank you. Thank you.